Well, good morning and good afternoon to the FISMA Friday friends. My name is Jim Albright and I am honored to be hanging out with the cool kids today. And I know that we're gonna have some fun in this session. Uh, but some of you probably are newcomers to our FISMA Friday series. So I wanted to give a quick intro. We here at Safety Chain wanted to bring some educational resources to food and beverage facility operators, QA and safety compliance folks, all around the shifts and twists within the Food Safety Modernization Act. So to do this, we've partnered with the Atchison Group, which is comprised of global food safety and public health experts and is led by former chief medical officer from the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. And he also was the former FDA Associate Commissioner of Foods. All right, but before we start, uh, just have a couple of housekeeping notes here. Um, all attendees will be muted, and we absolutely encourage sending comments and questions through the chat and questions panel, so please look for that, and please enter in your questions, because we will have an engaging Q&A at the end of this session. And second, yes, this recorded presentation will be sent later today, so you can replay the greatest hits. Okay, so let's get to our presenter. Uh, joining us today is Eric Edmonds. He's TAG's Director of Food Safety, uh, whose previous speaking engagements on our FISMA Friday series have gone triple gold platinum. Eric, you have brought so much insight to our FISMA friends in the past. I'm really excited to what you'll be sharing about navigating uh, the shifting quality and safety compliance standards. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background before we dive in? That sounds great. Thanks for having me, Jim. Uh, yeah, my name is Eric Edmonds. I've been working with the Atchison Group for about six years, and uh, my background is on the legal and regulatory side for the, the food industry, uh, both working uh, with the Oregon Department of Agriculture and their Food Safety Animal Health Program. There I managed the state rulemaking docket and updated the state's laws to align with both FDA and USDA expectations for, for any sort of manufactured food, as well as some, some retail uh, regulatory issues, and then worked in private legal practice for a little bit, providing food businesses with regulatory counsel, and I've used those experiences to, to help TAG provide our clients with, with regulatory guidance and I uh, spent a lot of time in a variety of food manufacturing facilities to, to get up to date on, on best industry practices and, and help people create programs that um, the FDA is happy to see. So uh, that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell, very focused on the, the regulatory aspects of food in general. But uh, with that, I think we're ready to get kicked off into the actual content for today. And as always, we'll, we'll start off with some general FDA updates. And since this webinar is going to be a little bit of a regulatory roundup, things we've seen um, in the last six months of 2022 and what we expect to see FDA focusing on for the rest of the year and onward. So the first two bullet points here are just a FYI, um, so you know about recent FDA guidance documents that have come out in the last month or so. Um, and so you're able to kind of look them up or um, <clears throat> see where kind of what the FDA has been focusing on. Um, so the first one, FDA guidance on reducing microbial hazards and seeds used for sprouts. Uh, as we all know, the sprout that sprouts either raw or lightly cooked have, have been kind of a, a common food safety issue and have caused a few recalls and, and outbreaks over the last few years. And FDA takes a particular notice on sprouts within the produce safety rule uh, to make sure that those seeds don't become a potential source of contamination for the finished product. Um, and really sets a high standard for those seeds that are used for, for sprouting. Uh, the next one, FDA guidance on their oversight of foods covered by system recognition arrangements. Uh, and this largely deals with imports, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the Foreign Supplier Verification Program later uh, within the slide deck. But for those in the know, uh, FDA works with different countries to assess their food safety regulatory framework to see if it aligns with FDA's expectations. 
And it really, when it comes to imports and assessing hazards and whether they're controlled by the uh, manufacturer in a foreign country, um, can can really make your job a whole lot easier in the United States if you're importing from a com company that is uh, located in a in a country that uh, has one of these system recognition as agreements. So the major ones there, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia can really help, but talks about things um, that they're looking at and whether products could still be subject to an import alert and how that would play out, as well as uh, any detention without physical examination by the FDA, which could cause some, some delays in your import process. So, so good guidance is to look over. And looking forward, I have this larger third bullet point with all the, the subcategories. The White House Office of Management and Budget kind of initiatives or re reviews that are going on, which really gives us a, a great idea of regulatory changes or really first time regulations that we'll expect to see come out soon. Uh, if you don't know, any FDA guidance or regulation that is um, being written or coming out uh, is required to be reviewed by the White House Office of Management Budget just to make sure that they align with kind of the, the White House's policy initiatives and objectives. So as you can see, there's, there's quite a bit of focusing on labeling issues. So how to label plant-based milk alternatives will be very interesting as we've seen some kind of conflict between the, the conventional dairy industry and plant-based milk alternatives for, for how they're going to be able to label those and not be considered misleading by the FDA. Um, and then some of the <clears throat> safety ones there, uh, inorganic arsenic and apple juice, action levels for lead and food intended for babies and young children. Um, we've seen a lot of issues in the news around that with some of those toxic hazards reports coming out. So FDA is looking to update their defect action levels, or their, their action levels for um, those kind of heavy metals and arsenic in, in those foods. So create a, a more clear regulatory framework for, for those companies uh, moving forward. Um, and kind of tied in with that, that's not really a bullet point here. There is a bit of movement in Congress to, to pass some statutes, uh, number one for uh, toxics in food um, that has the potential to, to change the kind of grass status or generally recognized as safe and what companies can do to, to bring new ingredients um, that will be used in foods to market. Um, and there's also a little bit of congressional movement in that regard with, with the current infant formula uh, issues that are going on um, that would essentially create a new office of critical foods. So the, the FDA would be looking into kind of assessing critical foods to, to make sure we don't run into supply issues for the, for the consumer as we have for uh, particularly infant formula as of late. So as we, as we kind of see, have seen in the past, issues and crises uh, spur congressional and regulatory action to address those in the future. Um, one that I'm really excited to, to see, um, that's the, the nerd in me speaking, is this nutrient content claim definition of the term healthy. Uh, FDA has been working on that for a long time and a little while ago, they released some, some guidance for comments um, about images that could be used to, to evaluate or to show to a consumer that a product is considered healthy per nutrition guidelines and dietary guidance by the FDA. Um, and so we've got a, a couple aspects on that as well. Um, so White House Office of Management budget can take anywhere from a month to six months or more to actually review these, but um, here at the midway point through the year, we'll probably expect those reviews to be get, getting completed with a high priority. Um, so by the end of the year, those, those should be released for our review. And uh, if, they, if, they, if and when they do come out, uh, I'm sure we'll have some webinars and ability to uh, discuss the details of those. Things to, 
to look into in terms of the, the regulatory roundup. We're going to cover a lot of issues, um, things to be aware of, things that are happening in the industry. So the first one we want to talk about was this uh, temporary policy for food labeling, um, which FDA released actually in May of 2020. Um, so it started with COVID-19 public health emergency, and they've uh, really said this is this is the way that if you have supply chain issues, you could change your product formulation in kind of minor ways um, without actually changing the label. And FDA would uh, really exercise enforcement discretion, um, even though the label may not be perfectly right um, because of a minor formulation formulation change such as uh, an omission or an alteration um, and, and you wouldn't run into any regulatory issues uh, if you're dealing with a supply chain issue. Um, and they do emphasize that printing new labels that, that are in line with any formulation changes or putting a sticker over the current, current label is what they would prefer but they recognize that's not always a realis realistic move um, from the food industry perspective. Um, so they have provided kind of a guideline of things to consider if you're doing a minor formulation change where they would have less, issue less issues. So if it's not feasible to print new labels or use a sticker, um, the, the things they want you to looking into is um, in terms of the ingredients is overall safety. So are you going to be introducing a new allergen or anything else that consumers may have a sensitivity to? Uh, you really don't want to make that formulation change without informing the, the consumer with the new label. So the safety of the product for if you're using a substitution. Um, then the next one, quantity, 2% uh, or less of the finished food by weight. So they, they don't want to see you doing major ingredient changes. Uh, largely focused on kind of the smaller ones that they're they're going to be a little more uh, lax on enforcement and, and provide a little more leeway in their discretion policies. Uh, then obviously getting into whether the product is going to be misleading. Um, the next two bullets, prominent statements on, on the label for an ingredient, you, you really don't want to change those. So the example there, made with real butter, if you change your ingredient from butter to margarine, uh, that's likely going to be considered misleading by the FDA and could open, open you up to some, some legal um, risk. Um, so be careful with that, as well as the characterizing your in the ingredient name. Uh, you don't want to make major changes there. Um, and lastly, any nutrition claim um, if the if the label substitution or omission changes that. So high in fiber, or any of those, if, you, if you're meeting with the original formulation and make a change, you'll want to make sure you're still um, in line with the, with, the, with, the, with the requirements for those. Um, and tying into that, any nutrition or functional change of the finished product, you'll, you'll be careful, you want to be careful with um, and making sure there's not any major uh, differentiation between the original label and what the formulation change may result in. And uh, one thing that the FDA does say is, so printing a new label using an alternative is, is not going to work. Um, there are other ways that you could uh, act to still provide consumers with the most information possible and help with the transparency of your company, whether it's adding on your advertising or websites or including point of sale labeling to, to provide the, the information of a formulation change that's not addressed on the label. So, so the consumer isn't totally in the dark on the change um, and uh, that would help um, in FDA's evaluation on whether they should uh, be enacting kind of their enforcement discretion. So this one, as you've seen, they, they may make an announcement anytime saying we're not going to be using this anymore. But from what we're seeing in the industry, um, in a combination of COVID-related supply chain issues and the war in Ukraine-related issues, um, supply chain challenges are very real still today. Um, and th they'll make a very public announcement if this temporary enforcement discretion policy goes by the wayside. Um, but I'm not expecting that anytime soon, 
just because of uh, what we're seeing in industry for, for certain um, ingredients and products and supply chain issues that are ongoing. Next, uh, the FASTER Act, sesame allergen labeling. So where it's no longer the big eight major food allergens, it's the big nine major food allergens, um, sesame being the ninth. And uh, the, the thing we wanna focus on now is the compliance date and how FDA is gonna enforce their kind of look at this. Um, January 1 of 2023, so you've got about six months to, to get into compliance. And the thing I wanted to, to focus on here, um, the other more recent big labeling change or labeling requirement was the Bioengineered Disclosure Act. And if you if you recall from that one, the way that the USDA kind of put the compliance in line, they also used the term introduced or uh, delivered for introduction into interstate commerce, but they put out a very clear definition that introduced into commerce was the date the label was applied. So you could potentially have a product in your warehouse um, at the manufacturing facility that was on the shelves, but the, the label was applied before the compliance deadline. So you could still ship those products um, and not be concerned with regulatory action. Um, but the thing to think about here is the sesame inclusion is a public health issue and could lead to safety issues for the consumer. And FDA seems to be creating a policy that's less lenient. So the only clear uh, information they have right now is a product is already on a retail shelves. It's not like you have to do a recall or withdrawal um, for those, but they, in their guidance, are alluding to the fact that anything that's not on the retail shelf already should be labeled correctly and follow this new um, sesame allergen declaration. So that could either be by name in the ingredient list. So if you have tahini or something, you'd want to have those parentheses saying sesame afterwards, or the the one you see more often now, the contained statement listing the allergens, you'll really want that included for anything that you ship out um, on or after January 1 of 2023. So that's why we're including this reminder here because it's uh, coming down and you'll really wanna be looking into not only the label, but how this new requirement affects your hazard analysis for other products. So cross allergen, cross contact issues um, and, and all of that. So it's, it's not gonna be adequate to start working on this after the compliance deadline. You'll really wanna get your programs now and six months isn't necessarily a lot of, a lot of time to update labels and reassess your your process. So uh, just this is a reminder that FDA wants to see movement in this now, not later. So something to, to think about from a, a risk control perspective. The next one that we're gonna touch on, and I'll I have a couple slides on this that I'll kind of skim through, but the thing I wanted to focus on, so these are the top 10 citations for 2021 and 22. Um, and if you, if you can read all of those, FSVP violations account for over 60% of the food safety violations or, or citations that the FDA has had in the last year and a half. So 45% uh, is failure to even develop an FSVP. Um, then the others are a, a little more within the program, the, the kind of starting at the 12 o'clock position on the pie chart to moving left, those, those three um, that are cited as 21 CFR 1.5. Um, those, those are all FSVP violations that are smaller aspects um, outside of that 45%. So this is a heads up that the, the FDA is really focusing on FSVP and wants to, to see these programs. And some people may say that, well, FSVP was a big issue because FDA was conducting remote FSVP inspections throughout the, the COVID pandemic. And now that they're doing on-site inspections again, we may not see as many of those. So we will likely see the percentage go down. But once FDA recognizes the fact that this is a compliance issue within the food industry, they're not gonna just turn their heads and focus on other things. They're gonna keep their focus on these. So uh, a quick overview, 
FSV player, FSVP applies to any importer of food. So the person that's going to be responsible for this is someone physically located in the United States. Um, if a company is importing food and they don't have a physical presence, they'd, they'd have to assign an agent or a representative uh, to, to handle the FSVP requirement. And uh, within that reminder, most foods are covered by FSVP. There's, there's some exemptions for half of regulated foods by an FDA jurisdiction. Um, and then some R&D, transcript goods, personal use. Um, but it's something to look into to make sure you you have an adequate program for, for most foods. Um, and we're obviously available to discuss in more detail. Um, I am going to throw out a reminder that there's supply chain requirements for the preventive controls rule um, that food manufacturers are going to be dealing with. And uh, they're very similar to the requirements for FSVP, more or less that things you're importing are being produced in a manner that would have would comply with FDA regulations. So it's, it's meeting the same safety standards um, there. Um, and you really have the option to comply with the FSVP requirements or the preventive control supply chain requirements if you are a processor. Um, and that's really because the requirements are the same there kind of duplicative programs and so companies can decide which one they're going to follow um, so they don't have to have a duplicative program and, and invest excessively in, in programs that accomplish the same goal. Uh, the thing we do want to point out here, um, when you're importing the food, you have to in identify the importer of a record on the import documentation that custom, custom and border um, controls are, are going to be reviewing and up until now and next month, um, you are allowed to use this UNK, which means unknown, essentially, if FSVP applied. Um, and that was because um, a Dunn's number um, that you can get from Dunn and Bradstreet is what you use for the importer identification um, that's unique to them. Um, and originally, FDA had to recognize that some companies may not have a Dunn's number, so they were allowing time for, for companies to get that, um, which is a free process and, and fairly simple to do. Uh, but starting July 24th, um, they're no longer going to allow that unknown thing. So if you don't have a dunce number, you want to make sure you're getting on top of that and getting that. Because if you try to use the unknown ind indicator um, after July 24th, you're going to be your import or your food or ingredient is going to be rejected by, by Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so you don't want that to compound any issues with the supply chain you may already be having. Having So really make sure that if you have that all in line and your DUNS number so, so you don't run into issues with your import. This next slide is, is really just a for your information. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the general requirements of FSCP, what you should be doing, conducting a hazard analysis of food and then reviewing those supplier documents to make sure they're actually controlling that um, in, to, in order to create a approved supplier program. And then ongoing verification to make sure they're still implementing those programs or um, even reevaluating your, your foreign supplier program at least every three years. Um, and then number eight there, identify the FSVP importer entry, make sure you've got that DUNS number um, so you don't get rejected at the border um, regardless of, of your overall program. Um, and we'll just keep this in the slide so you can refer to it when we send out the, the presentation later today. Okay, I wanted to provide a little bit of an update on Delta 8, THC, and CBD because it's become a hot topic. Um, you may have seen some headlines recently saying, oh, Delta 8, THC is legal now. Um, and that's because of a decision that came out of the Ninth Circuit um, about, a, well, a, a little less than a month ago. Um, Delta 8, THC is a, is a compound that's found in hemp and cannabis. Um, and if, if you're familiar with the 2018 Farm Bill and it, the way it legalized hemp it, um, and all of its derivatives, um, but there had been some confusion uh, with Delta 8 THC um, within the industry uh, because there's some DEA regulations that said, 
uh, the way you're synthesizing delta-8 THC and its psychoactive properties still make it a controlled substance. Um, so there was a trademark case out of uh, the Ninth, Dist Ninth Circuit that kind of said, no, delta-8 THC is legal within the uh, with, within the purview of the 2018 Farm Bill. The language in the Farm Bill was really clear that any derivative of hemp is there um, legally, um, doesn't depend on how it's synthesized. And, and largely that is because delta-8 THC is typically synthesized from CBD, um, which has its own issues. But the thing I wanted to point out here is that law, there, that case coming out of the Ninth Circuit did not apply to Delta-8 THC or CBD in food. So from the FDA perspective, these are still very much illegal to add in food. Um, FDA has been implementing some enforcement discretion on CBD. So the key there is to avoid making any me medical or drug claims um, that, that could run afoul of the way FDA is enforcing that right now. And, and they've been a little more uh, attentive to delta-8 THC in general because of its psychoactive properties. So from the FDA perspective, uh, these are, are both illegal food ingredients. Um, some states have some different requirements within their state programs, but as far as the FDA is concerned, it's, uh, it's a big issue um, that you'll what you want, want to be very careful about. Um, and moving forward for either product, um, looking, looking ahead, I just want to say, it's probably going to take a little while for the FDA to, to really reach a conclusion and, and put out more clear regulation on these, particularly Delta-8 THC because of the psychoactive properties. And FDA has been a little more active in releasing and giving out warning letters to companies dealing with these, particularly if they're making any medical or, or drug claims um, on those products. So it's, it's going to be an uphill um, battle for, for either of these and even CBD at this point. Um, if you're looking at the world as an example, uh, the European Food Safety Agency recently uh, released a statement that said, we've got to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on CBD evaluation as a food ingredient because there's just not enough information out there that we can do a good assessment of its safety in food products. So with, with that coming out, and they're a little bit ahead of the FDA in terms of policy development, um, and FDA is very science-based, so um, I don't expect a lot of clarity within the next year, but um, fingers crossed always that FDA will be able to get something out to provide a little more regul regulatory clarity in this arena. And then uh, the last thing that we wanted to just touch on, um, another guidance that came out a little while ago from the FDA and the headline on FDA's website is FDA urges companies to be recall ready. And they announced this voluntary uh, guidance or voluntary recall guidance document. So these are the things that most people have a recall plan, but um, these are the items addressed within the guidance um, that you want to go back and review your recall plan to make sure you're actually including all of these because with it being a new guidance, these are going to be the areas FDA focuses on in any review um, and could directly infect, affect the, the likelihood of, of getting a 483 for not having adequate recall plans, um, largely because having a recall, written recall plan is considered a preventive control within the preventive controls rules from FDA. So um, there's a, a direct CFR citation that they could they could write you up for if, if you're not meeting these. So uh, quick, quick overview, get the names and job responsibilities of your recall team and backups. We know, especially during summer, people may be going on vacation, maybe doing all sorts of things and uh, you don't want to make sure, you don't want to have any gaps and your recall team if, if you do have to deal with one while people are out of the office. Um, clear communication plan for information that's uh, put out or even used internally uh, during a recall. Uh, make sure you're aware of when you are required to report something in a recall to the FDA. So the reportable food registry is the, the big one there. If you have a, a hazard that's likely to cause a class one recall, essentially, you're required to tell the FDA 
Um, so you don't want to run afoul of that requirement. And it's a 24 hour reporting requirement. So um, there can't be much delay in that. Um, then to, to help kind of with quick traceability and quick recall enactment, um, make sure you've got your product coding uh, up to date and it's clear and easy to understand. So you have good traceability both forward and backward of your finished product and ingredients and even in process. Um, and just double check to, to make sure you are able to contact the right people in the event of a recall, both your customers, their direct accounts, um, and the FDA recall coordinator. The guidance has a link to the FDA webpage that has every, every district recall coordinator information. Um, and I always encourage companies to maybe even just reach out and start opening up that relationship with the FDA, FDA recall coordinator um, because it's, it's, it's just harder to get things going um, if you have no interaction with them before you're actually doing your recall. Um, and they really are there to help you meet your regulatory requirements while protecting public health. So they're, they're a great resource that's free. Um, so um, use those. Um, and, the, and the last one, communication templates. Uh, the FDA doesn't want to see you um, with no communication template where you're going to have to sit down and start from scratch on how you're going to communicate to the public or your direct accounts in the event of a recall. Um, that includes things like what you expect them to do with the product, whether it's return it or sequester it and, dis and dispose of it or destroy it. Um, just have that ready to go so you don't have to get uh, hung up on those issues and writing new documents. Um, and, and that will help effectuate a fast and effective recall um, within, within your program. So things to look at for being recall ready in FDA's point of view. So just as a quick summary wrap up of all the things we covered, um, there are some um, opportunities to do formulation changes with, uh, without having an FDA regulatory issue coming up. Uh, but there are clear outlines of things to consider for that um, to make sure you're not going to run afoul of FDA expectations. Um, if, if you haven't already worked on your sesame allergen program to comply with the FASTER Act, the time is now. Um, you don't want to be behind the eight ball um, in six months. There's not necessarily a lot of time to, to look into all that, so be, be careful about there. Um, we expect FSVP in inspections, investigations, and enforcement to continue to be a priority of the FDA. Um, and judging by the number of citations for lack of FSVP programs in general, um, there, there's a bit of work on that in the industry. And for the QA folks that have a separate import-export division, you may want to touch base with them to make sure they're aware of that um, unknown classification not being able to use, be used next month. To, because they may not have the same kind of direct contact with FDA announcements to make sure they're aware. Um, Delta-8, THC, and CBD, um, yeah, just hoping for regular, regulatory clarity there. So that's, a, that's an area to, to keep your eye on if, if you're moving into uh, including any of those ingredients in a food product and um, can, can have a lot of issues. Um, and finally, uh, Take a review of your recall plan and make sure it addresses those, those topics that FDA is focused on in their new guidance document. Um, bit of a whirlwind presentation, um, but I'm still available um, to answer some questions if we go that, if anyone has any, and uh, I'll turn it over to, to Jim um, to, to lead any question and answer. All right, Eric, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And we have a ton of questions that have come in. So I hope uh, I hope you're ready. Are you ready? Here we go. Rapid fire. I want, to make sure, I want to make sure we get through all of these. Okay. Uh, great job, by the way. Um, all right, we've got one in here from Marlene. She says, if there is a sale of bulk food for animal feed, what is the required labeling of the bulk packaged food? So if there's a bulk food sale for animal feed, what is the labeling requirement for the bulk packaged food? So 
there there may be a couple different considerations there and like where you're talking about in transport for for bulk bulk food um there's there aren't really labeling requirements per se but the things that you would typically see on a label um are required to accompany the shipment so that could be on a bill of lading or um various types of um <clears throat> ways to transmit that information. But when it gets into a retail store, the, the thing you're looking at including is a point of sale labeling um, where people could be scooping or anything like that that includes the, the required information. So product name, um, potentially nutrition information, um, as, as, as um, well as kind of an ingredient list for mixes and um, allergen declarations there. So kind of depends on at what point in the supply chain you're looking at. Um, but the, the real important part is information accompanying the food along the supply chain and it's out there for the consumer in the retail setting. All right, got it. Yeah, this is a good segue. I've got a few questions here on your um, product labeling changes around the sesame ingredient. Uh, Brian asks, is it important that any labeled product listed on a website is kept up to date when the product formulas and corresponding labels changes are made? So basically, when you change the label, the assumption is you have to change it online as well, I'm assuming. Yes? Definitely. Um, the FDA is going to consider any product information that so the exact same way they're going to consider the label on the actual food package. Um, information on the website, they, they consider essentially a label as well. So um, particularly if people are ordering off that website, so they have the information before they get that because, I mean, historically, grocery store, people can review the product label um, before they buy it on your on your website. Um, they're really relying on that information. So I, I treat that the same way as you would the label on the on the actual finished food product. Awesome. Okay. Uh, in the same vein, so uh, after the deadline, if the product is on the shelf, but the label is uh, maybe a little incorrect, uh, but the product's already on the shelf, as you said, you don't have to recall it, uh, but do you need to put some type of point of sale or other notice out for the consumer? Not, not from a regulatory requirement, from a consumer transparency and kind of best practices, it, it, it may be something wise to consider. Um, but really, FDA does recognize that you, things are out there that have long shelf life, canned foods and everything that may be on the shelf already. So it's not going to be a re regulatory requirement, but um, from a, a legal risk perspective, you may want to look into that just to make sure consumers aren't confused because in reality they don't know when the product was placed on the label and uh, that kind of regulatory time of was it on the shelf before January 1 or after uh, the consumer may not know that so they may rely on things and while you wouldn't necessarily face regulatory issues if you can prove it was on the shelf beforehand um, that doesn't necessarily protect you from uh, causing an anaphylactic reaction uh in 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 your food uh from a customer who didn't know when it was put on the shelf yeah okay good just wanted to get clarity around that um all right let's uh let's talk about we have a question here from angela she says how does the faster act affect finished label products that have not yet been sent to the customer by the deadline january 1st of 23 and that's the one way i'm kind of focusing on saying Make sure you update your labels now because everything I've read and kind of touched base with some FDA contacts on says if it hasn't been shipped into commerce at this point um, and or is shipped any time on or after January 21 or January 1st, um, it needs to have the proper label on it to, to be worry free in terms of regulatory enforcement. So uh, something to, to be a attentive to. If you're making something today that you're not going to ship um, until next year, um, you may have to look into relabeling that product. So um, getting, that, getting that all lined up as soon as possible is going to prevent any issues with relabeling or even disposing products if, if it's impossible to reprocess and relabel. 
Yep. All right. So obviously get that plan in place. Uh, Angela has asked another question, follow-up question here. So most of our foreign supplied ingredients are sent to us through vetted brokers. So do they need to verify the done numbers if the broker is handling the process? Typically not. And uh, so this one, I want to caveat a little bit that there may be a little bit detail specific information. Um, if the broker is, and this is where you come into that definition of importer of record, the, the person who buys or owns the food when it's offered for import, um, most brokers will be considered the uh, importer of record in those cases, unless if they're just a transitory point and you're technically the owner when it enters. Um, but when you're dealing with a broker that's handling the import and then selling it to you, it's, it's likely going to fall on to them to comply with the FSVP requirements. Okay. Does the SFVP rule also apply to animal feed? This question comes from Jennifer. Um, I'm actually drawing a blank. I, I'm going to have to double check that. Um, for the, I believe it is actually human food, but don't. Um, I'll have to follow up with you on that. To to, I don't want to misspeak on on that one. No problem. No problem. Uh, at, at the top of your presentation, you were talking about this new Office of Critical Foods, uh, just so that folks won't run into any additional supply chain issues. Um, is, is there, I guess, can you, can you provide an update to where that's at in its development so, so we can understand when that might take effect? Um, that one is going to be essentially impossible. When, when you're getting bills like that proposed in Congress, there's too many variables to really say because it gets proposed in Congress and um, they have to come back in session to actually vote on it and you don't, don't actually know if it's um, going to. And then you obviously have to provide a timeline for the FDA to implement that. Um, and uh, so it's it's impossible to say it may not actually happen, but with the with the current issues going on, um, it's it's making the headlines, and um, so yeah, that's that's a little too difficult to predict. And and, and just going back to the previous question, um, I just pulled up my notes here. Yes, FSCV does apply to apply to both human and animal food, um, making sure there's process. All right, Jennifer, I hope you're still with us. Yes, according to the experts, your question is affirmative. All right, good. Um, so we, we were talking about uh, the, the FDA new release in March and um, how you should be in compliance with preventative controls rule. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about like how that impacts product coding or distribution records, things like that? Just basically um, provide a couple of quick tips around what to plan for and prepare for. Okay, well... The product coding isn't really a FDA requirement, but what you want to be looking at is good and clear product coding uh, in the event of a recall. So you can say it's, it allows you to create bookends essentially. So if, if there's no product coding or it's difficult to understand and within your process, you may get a situation where let's say the FDA test the food and find it has finds it has a pathogen in it. If you don't have really good product coding, the FDA may come back and say, you need to recall everything you've ever made um, because we can't verify what's in the market. We, consumers have nothing to look at to see if this the lot they have was affected. So product coding is really going to help you identify which foods may be subject to a recall and um, really limit your burden or your risk in, in, in the volume of product that you'd be recalling um, while helping you, you, you do it quickly to protect public health. All right, good. Um, yeah, the, um, you made a comment before, how, how might the FDA update action levels? This was, I think, around your first or second slide. Um, just come some clarity around which action levels are they considering updating? Um, the ones that I was talking about was lead and food for 
both infants and young children, and arsenic and apple juice. So heavy metals and arsenic, they're, they're found in nature, in, in, in nature and are in foods. There's really not a way you can 100% avoid them. Uh, any vegetable fruit that's growing in the ground could be getting a, a small uptake of heavy metals within that. And so what the FDA has done is done assessments to say, well, if there's very minuscule amounts that's unavoidable due to the, the nature of the raw agricultural commodity or, or anything like that, um, we're going to allow it in the finished food because we don't believe it's going to have an effect on the health of the individual that's consuming it. Um, and as toxicology information and data from, from the scientific world gets updated, um, we may recognize that, well, maybe um, the level that we had in lead for food or arsenic and apple juice, which um, arsenic is, is more common in apples, but um, is not really adequate to protect public health. So we're going to lower that number and uh, kind of put a more stringent requirement on the industry to make sure that they aren't below, aren't above those levels. So it's it's really a combination of developing science on what amounts could affect our overall health and uh, also detection capabilities and um, getting down to smaller percentages of the product. Um, but really just updating that to, to what level the FDA thinks you need to be at to minimize risk to the consumer. Yeah, 100%. All right, good. Uh, Cole, Cole just, uh, sorry, Vernon just came in and he was just saying the, um, He's he's retired now, but he said the uh, FSVP importer of record, uh, they always check the Dunn's number on everything that they ordered. So he's he's uh, making that comment there. Uh, he also said, um, uh, oh, he he's just continuing his story. Okay, thanks, Vernon. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up here. I I want to thank Eric. I think um, there's so much here to learn from this presentation. So good news, we're gonna send the recording out to everybody, you can re-watch it. I'm also gonna send some additional information along your way uh, from the TAG uh, folks, just to help you understand some of the different changes and shifts in FISMA going on right now. Uh, so please look out for that later today, along with the recording and the slides. Uh, if you would like to uh, check out our mitigating label shortage guide, uh, that would be good reading material over your um, your weekend so check that out please do check that out eric any last remarks before we call it a day here i think we're pretty well covered so i just want to say thanks for having me on and i hope everyone has a, a great weekend all right we'll do that thank you sir we'll hope to see you very soon on the next fisma friday but we do appreciate everything that we heard today thank you so much thank you yeah